Guys, a couple things for today. Uh, Coach Diaz will open with an opening statement about signing day in, in this past month of January. Please wait for the mics. These are being streamed on ESPN and on other platforms. Wait for the mics. If you have a follow-up question, just hold on to the mic um, before you hand it back to anyone who's walking up and down the sides. But we'll start with an opening statement from Coach Diaz. All right. Uh, appreciate everybody coming here today. Um, college football, like any other um, profession, it's about – the culture and it's about the people and uh, you want to improve an, or an organization you improve the people within the organization and we have had a step-by-step um, um, -step over the, pa the, the past month we feel really good about the people that we've brought into this organization um, leading up to the news we just got about a half hour ago um, you know with Avante Williams uh, committing signing with, with uh, Miami uh, joining six other guys that we really didn't, you know, we sat here December 18th, I guess, and we were talking about 18 guys that we we're really proud of. Um, and to be able to add six more names to that list, two of which signed today, uh, four that are actually already on our campus, uh, is a great addition to our football team. It gives us a lot of uh, excitement and optimism heading into spring practice. Um, just to kind of go through some of the names that we didn't get a chance to speak on uh, the last time we were here. Um, Jose Borgales, um, um, massive addition to our football team. Obviously, I was, was aware of our place kicking struggles a year ago and how that impacted into our win and loss record. Uh, we know that he's very talented. We had a great relationship with that family. Um, and we're very excited the fact that he's already here and, 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 and enrolling classes and going through workouts. Um, the other uh, young man at high school that signed today is Isaiah Dunson, a uh, cornerback who was, um, for a while, that was committed to Florida State. Um, Mike Rump did a great job in terms of, um, and with the help of the Marcus Van Dyke, of recruiting him. Uh, great length at corner, uh, great ball skills, uh, comes from an outstanding family. Um, we think he's going to be a great addition to our secondary this year. Uh, obviously, the quarterback, Derek King, um, you know, what he did uh, two years ago at Houston has not been done very often in college football history. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, again, Rhett Lashley, I think when he got here, did a great job of of, um, you know, when Derek went into the portal, of convincing him of our vision of what we want to be offensively here, uh, getting him excited in terms of um, the, the playmakers that you have around him and obviously the, the need that we have at quarterback to have a, to a stable guy, not just on the field, but also off the field uh, that can really make this thing go. Quincy Roche, uh, defensive end uh, from Temple. Again, you're talking about a guy that was his conference player of the year, uh, very disruptive. As everybody knows, obviously getting after the quarterback is a big part of our identity uh, of what we do on defense. Um, and so it's a very similar thing when Quincy uh, put his name in the portal. Obviously, we did have some ties, a couple of guys on our staff who had worked at Temple uh, with some time and had worked with Quincy. Quincy knew what he would be getting into from a culture standpoint here, which, which he was very excited about, um, but also the ability to play with the guys that we have up front um, and to be able to make the plays that he thinks he'll be able to make here. Uh, was a great uh, benefit to him. We think a great benefit to our defense. A guy that we um, uh, that's already on our campus that we're that already watching go through workouts. We're very excited. Is Keyshawn Smith. Keyshawn is a wide receiver from Lincoln High School in San Diego. Um, very fast, dynamic football player, uh, catching the ball down the field or on run and catch uh, possibilities. Um, a young man who has was uh, signed, sealed, delivered to go to Washington State, and when they had a coaching change. At Washington State, he was released from his NLI. After his release in his NLI, we sort of got involved with all that. Um, it all happened very quickly, and we're, um, we're very excited to, to bring Keyshawn here. So those six names, again, a lot of the credit goes to our coaching staff, um, our recruiting staff, you know, led up with Andy Vaughn, David Cooney, Demarcus Van Dyke, Edwin Pata, uh, Brooke Wilson. Have, they've done a, an outstanding job of, of really seeing this class home. We talk about all the time fix your issues, right? Fix your issues. And, and even going back a year ago, we felt like one of the major issues we had to fix in our program to get our program back to where we wanted to was through recruiting. I think 12 months later, uh, we see the end product of that. Uh, we also talk about trying to improve our issues in terms of our culture, starting in the locker room, starting in the weight room. I think those things have happened, and I think that's why you are attracting good people. Good people want to come for good reasons, and I think those reasons are real. They exist on our campus, and, and again, all that coming full circle today with Avante uh, signing with us um, to play, and again, amazing job by Efren Bonda on that, Blake Baker, our defensive staff. Um, things are moving in, in, in the right direction. We're very excited to, uh, to continue to work with our guys through off-season programs. So with that, open up for questions. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone. Uh, Coach, you, you mentioned 
mentioned the culture a couple of times and improving the culture uh, from your point of view, what, what needed improving upon? From the culture that was here? From eight, you know, 12 months ago? Yes. Your, your culture in college football is setting your weight room. Um, and that when I talk about culture in terms of how guys work, you know, um, the way they, they, they attack everything, the way they come to the building. Um, and those things we feel like were put in place in the last 12 months. Now, not, it does, that doesn't mean that everybody in the organization buys into that culture. And that, mean, that doesn't mean that everyone in your organization fits into your culture. And that's probably one of the great lessons that I've learned is that you want desperately for everyone to buy and you want desperately for everyone to, to believe in the culture and believe in what you're doing. Um, but the reality is it's not for everybody. Um, the great thing about this sport is you have the opportunity to recruit to your culture. Um, and so when the guys come on campus, they get hosted by our players who did an amazing job of, of hosting what you're talking about, the transfers, you're talking about the kids coming out of high school. Um, they see what's going on here. They see what's real. Um, and they want to be a part of that. You know, people were drawn to, to the way our guys are. You know, I mean, that, um, you, when you talk about the, the level of transfers, let's use those guys for an example. I mean, they, they could have gone about anywhere they wanted to go. Uh, and they had to know that the guys in our locker room were serious about winning, you know, and they were serious about getting this thing turned around. Um, so I, I don't think you can fake that. I, you know, a coach, we can sell that, but, but the players, there has to be something real there that other players will pick up on and they'll want to join. Hey, man, can you take us through the process of Avante if it was, if it was a pins and needles moment or if you guys had an idea and just what sort of, do you feel like it kind of puts an exclamation point on what you've been able to pull off the last five weeks? It's a massive exclamation point. There, there's no doubt because Avante, is, you know, I think we've known Avante since the summer coming out of eighth grade. I believe that's right. Yeah, the summer coming out of eighth grade. I mean, this is this is a four-year relationship, uh, and again with with Coach Bonda, who's been the point man on that for four years. Um, you know, he was committed at one point, you know, too early to be committed in reality and, and went all kinds of different ways. And um, he's one of those guys just, you know, I, I, we, 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 you know and again, I got to give all the credit to Coach Bonnet. We never gave up on him. But it just felt like there was just a feeling that Avante was a cane at heart. In recruiting, you just get to know these guys. Just, it just, there's just something about them that they just fit in here, you know. And, and it just, there's a feeling. And um, we talked a lot about that when he came on his visit uh, a couple weeks ago. And... Um, in terms of when we knew is was when the proverbial facts came in. I mean, it was just, it was, um, I mean, he's such an explosive guy, you know what I mean? And, and a guy that can help, help our defense out a lot of different places on the field. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a big, big finish to the recruiting cycle. Manny, two things. What ultimately led you to conclude that going to an up-tempo spread was the right thing for the program? Was it something you had thought about throughout last season? Did it, uh, was it something that you just came to that conclusion in late December? And then offensive line-wise, do you feel that the issues you had last year can be solved with simply the two freshmen, Rivers Washington, Cleveland Reed coming back, and the guys who you already have, or do you think a grad transfer is needed? Okay, so um, we'll start with the second question first. Um, we, we still have um, one slot left, and, and that could certainly f uh, feature for offensive line, but you're not going to take a guy to take a guy. You have to take a guy that improves your football team, right? Um, and everyone knows that those linemen are in short supply. But we'll certainly, uh, like everyone else in America, we'll, we'll have our, our ears open and, and, and eyes open to see what, what's available out there. Um, we, suspect our, <clears throat> we suspect our guys will play better. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think everybody's very excited about Garen Justice uh, joining our program to coach that unit. Uh, it comes with a great reputation. Um, sometimes the guys will be better because we return all five, and experience is important at that position. You know, there's not a lot of people um, that play a whole season with two true freshmen on their offensive line. Um, but there is no doubt that the up-tempo offense in college football, one of the great things it does is helps out your offensive line play because it tires out the defensive line. The hardest thing to do in college football is to rush the passer. Um, and all of a sudden, if, if once, once the, the, the amount of time between plays starts to speed up, um, those guys' level of play on defense starts to drop. That's why it's so important for us defensively to have depth on our defensive front, right? That's why a guy like Quincy Roche is so vital uh, to our efforts because people try to wear you down up front and to, try to take the edge off your pass rush. So, uh, so all those things to me we think will help 
the performance of our offensive line. And then in terms of the idea of to go tempo, um, I think if you just, again, if you, if you, you sort of step back a little bit and you look where things are going in college football and you look at the, where the game is going, um, there's not a lot of people winning without it. And there's not a lot of people scoring a lot of points without it. And, um, and we felt like that was the best way to improve our football team going forward. Manny, can you take us through the process of uh, getting Ed Reed into the building and also um, what his duties will be in this new chief of staff role? I know there were like eight or nine things listed in uh, that release as far as what he'll have a hand in, but just kind of what are, or what are his expectations uh, in this new role? Yeah, very, very excited about adding Ed. There's, there's, there's so many new exciting things to talk about. Um, gosh, the process of getting Ed in here is probably, I've lost track of days, but it's probably about a three-week process. Uh, I got to give a lot of credit to uh, Blake James and uh, Jen Strolley for, um, number one, giving us the ability to, to go get a guy like Ed and, and do what it takes to, to be able to, to get that deal done. Um, our chief of staff position is a position that was on our staff a year ago uh, that, re that went unfilled when Todd Stroud replaced Jeff Simpson as our defensive line coach. So there, this had been a role. Uh, when I first became head coach that I felt like was very important um, to the success of our program. Success of our we just didn't, have, just didn't feel like there were the right guys showed up um, last spring to take that job as win to the season. So uh, we knew actively that we'd be wanting to replace that role as we got into 2020. Um, that, that is a job to me that, uh, you know, number one is going is to serve as, as, a, as, as a sounding board, as an advisor to me, uh, another set of eyes, somebody who um, sometimes can – see things that I can't see at practice, see things I can't see at a workout, um, you know, and, and can kind of come up to me and say, hey, you know, you may want to look at the way that, no, I'm not, not, not like in the body language of this guy, or, or may, may have something to say about um, an interaction between a player and a player, an interaction between a player and a coach. Uh, might be a guy that can go into the locker room after practice and, and um, you know, put his arm around a player and, and you know, and just kind of talk about, Hey, what's going on in your life? You know, what's going on? You can serve as a mentor for our players because you're not in that direct role of being on the coaching staff. Um, and then certainly in terms of whether it's it's uh, behind the scenes, uh, in the meeting rooms, can help evaluate in terms of everything we're doing. And, and again, just be a whether that's it's a supporting opinion, a, a, you know, opinion as a playing the devil's advocate, just to make sure that we're making the right decision in everything that we do. Um, when you talk about a guy like Ed Reed, what makes I mean, there's so many things that make him unique and special that go way beyond what he did as a football player. I mean, I mean, his obviously his, his, his football resume would stand up on his own, but that that's really not even beginning to tell the story for me of who Ed Reed is and. Um, his when, when when you when you when you just get get to speak with him, his ability to understand team dynamics, understand team chemistry, team culture. We use a culture word all the time around here. Is is elite. It's second to none. He really has a great knack of understanding um, where others stand, where others stand in the locker room, and and, and the fact that. Great football teams are all connected to one another. Players all feel that connection to one another. And, and any breakdown in that connection somehow breaks down the trust, the bond that, that all great teams have to have. So his ability to be able to see that, to understand locker room dynamics, um, I mean, what, who, who wouldn't benefit from having that in, in your football program? So um, in addition to, again, all of his, you know, what he knows about the game and, 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 a, and, a great, and, then, and then a great mentor for our players, a guy that when recruits come on campus, you know, he's allowed to meet with recruits when they come on campus, you know. I mean, so, I mean, he, he ticks, you know, 10 out of 10 to me in every box. Hey, Manny, you made a lot of uh, big decisions here in the last 40 days or so. Um, what did you see that said, I got to change things and I got to make some drastic changes here? Well, we, we've talked about it a lot of times. I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy analytics um, I mean, there, there were some things that were, that were broken on our football team that were rather obvious but but you know you, you play the season out and and you look at where we have to improve our football team um, that's my job my job is to is to be able to identify and the job of any leader in any organization is to be able to identify your issues find the solutions secure the solutions and 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 and, and follow through with that so to me it was about fixing our issues um, and we feel like we've addressed our issues. I'm not going to stand here and, and say our issues are fixed. We have a lot of right, – right now, now the work begins. We've brought in the right people into our organization. I feel really good about the people we have here, but now we have to get to work. Um, 
but uh, but I think that's where it comes from. I think you have to look at you have to look at the data of, of what we've done, the data of what we did a year ago. We, I went back ten years and look at the data of you know what we've done, you know, offense, defense, special teams, recruiting rankings, you know, to try to get a, an idea of really where we stand and where we've come from in terms of where we're going. What what you know internally, what should be our expectation for performance, um, and where were we falling short? So in all those ways, you have a chance to. Now, I'll say this. You can identify your issues. Um, the part on that, that, that I'm most happy about is we're able to solve them with the people that we solve them with, right? Uh, the, the, the quality of the people that we've brought in, whether you're talking about the staff or whether you're talking about these, these six young men that we're talking about here today, um, is what has me the most excited. Hey, Manny. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, the culture and how this is maybe not for everybody. We've obviously seen some guys leave here, players. Um, Internally, from just a, maybe a discipline standpoint, guys breaking rules, team rules, etc. Are are, are, is that changing as well? Are you stiffening up some of those rules as far as what you've learned after this first year? We, our structure in terms of how our rules are laid out, um, have been in place, will be in place. They've been the same. Our rules that have been broken have been the discipline has been there. They've been disciplined for those types of things. Um, but what you're doing is you're finding sometimes you've got the repeat offenders who just this isn't the place for them, you know, and they and they got to find another place to go, and and that's all part of it, you know. Look, it's it's easy when a young man makes a mistake to to try to just say, okay, hey, you know, you're out of here. That you you want to help them because they are young, they have a chance to to learn, and and you have to ask yourself at all times, are there mistakes coming from immaturity, um, or do they really struggle understanding right from wrong? And ultimately, it comes down to two choices. Every decision I make is a selfish choice for me, or it's a choice for the team. And if I continue to put myself in front of the team, then ultimately those are guys that, that will get you beat. It's, 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 that, it's that simple. And so what we're trying to do is, is find more guys that, that make less selfish decisions um, and, and think about team, whether they're in this building, whether they're in Hard Rock Stadium, or, or they're away from us you know, in the time that we don't have them. Hey, I know you don't get to work with the guys too much right now, um, but I was wondering if you could go in a little more on the first impression, D.R. King's made on you, maybe from what you see that the first impression he's made on the, the players too? Um, well, very impressive, you know, even just getting to know him in the short sort of recruiting window that we had, um, the way he thinks, I mean, just being able to talk to him and his recall, I mean, he could almost list every quarterback to come out of high school in the state of Texas that were three years older than him, three years younger than him, just a guy that's aware of the game and aware of what's around him, uh, which means he's a student of the game. Uh, we had our first off-season workout uh, yesterday, uh, and it, it was impressive watching him watching him go. Again, there's not a football present, um, but there's a lot there's a lot of effort present, and 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 you can see the athleticism and, and watching him move and watching him strain, um, watching him compete, watching him win sprints, things like that uh, was a sight to see. It's as, as we know, and as we've said multiple times, um, you can have something special when when your quarterback is your leader and your hardest worker on offense, and and that was one of the reasons. I mean, everyone can. Google his highlights on YouTube and see what he can do with the spectacular plays. But, you know, the stuff that really gets the coaches excited is what he does when no one's cheering for him and when no one's watching. Hey, Manny. Um, yeah. Just playing off what uh, Manny Navarro said uh, regarding De'Ara King and Jaron Williams before, I know there were obvious issues um, with the previous quarterback situation. Um, he missed the uh, Jaron missed the practice. Reports of busted curfews. How will Derek, do you think, be a step up off the field, discipline-wise, not just in the weight room, um, over the last quarterback regime, maturity-wise? Well, I think that's part of what you the homework you do in the recruiting cycle, right? I mean, you're trying to find out um, everything you can about. Derek or any, any of the other players that you're bringing into your program, you know, in terms of what are your habits. And, and one of the things we talked to Derek about, and, and I'll say this, our quarterback room over the last few years has suffered because of not having a player-led, a, a player-to-player mentorship, you know. I want Derek King to not just make us better by the way he plays quarterback this year. I want him to make the quarterbacks on our roster better by training them on how to – be in a meeting, how to practice, how to watch film on your own, how to get the guys to, to go throw routes when coaches aren't allowed to go, you know, um, so that he doesn't just improve our football team in 2020, he improves it beyond, 
right? Because if I'm Tyler Van Dyke, who, who we still think the world of, and I just showed up, and I, I, I don't know how to be a college quarterback. I know how to play quarterback. I know how to throw a, a pass. But what do, what do I do? How, how, do I get, how do I get a wideout that's three classes older than me to come on his free time and come catch balls from me. You know what I mean? And that, and that to me is what it's just been, we've been waiting for in the quarterback room where you finally have that older guy, an experienced guy, right, that can not just lead our offensive all team but really change the culture and the dynamic of that room. Do you think Jared was just too young for, for the recruiters to know that? It's hard. It's hard to say. You know what I mean? And, and you know, I'd, I'd rather talk about the guys that are on our football team right now. Hey Manny, how important is uh, how important is in-state recruiting to your program? And can you talk about kind of building that wall around Florida, keeping in-state guys here, specifically South Florida guys in your in your own backyard? Well, it's where every recruiting meeting we have begins. Um, every recruiting meeting we have begins with um, Dade County, to Broward County, to Palm Beach County. I mean, that is our state, right? Uh, then you take it north to I-4 corridor south. Um, we have other parts of the state, like you know Duval County has been great for us. You know, we've gotten great players out of the Panhandle. Um, ideally, if, if we had it our way, we'd never got an airplane to recruit. That's just not always the way it's going to work out, though, right? Um, you've got to go where the guys are, and, and all the great Miami teams historically have always been supplemented with some really, really strong out-of-state players. So that's, all, that's always going to be a part of what we do. Um, we wish we could keep every player home. There's just simply too many of them. Um, I know the better we play on the field, the better product we show, the more of the players that they will want to stay home. But we feel really good about the guys. Uh, from this area, from the state um, that did choose Miami. Um, we're already into the next cycle, you know, in terms of some of the guys that are, um, you know, from this area that we're, that we're sort of going after very hard. Um, but, you know, ultimately the best recruiting we can do is on Saturday afternoons in the fall um, and to get our team to play very well. You alluded to how quickly the Keyshawn Smith thing kind of came together. Uh, I was wondering if you just kind of take us through the process of finding him and I know you know he, he committed before ever coming to campus for a visit or anything like that and what kind of made you feel like he was he was going to be a fit uh, here yeah that was very unusual you know that's not a story you hear of all the time kind of very unusual um, I know Stephen Field you know did a great job of kind of identifying Keyshawn um, and when he got released and became available where we were allowed to you know number one find out if he had any interest you know I mean you know we had looked at with what we were doing offensively um, the number we wanted to hit at wide receiver grew. We feel like we need a little more wide, a little more depth at wide receiver in our football team um, because of the amount of snaps that we expect to play on offense. Um, so we felt like we had to add a guy. Um, this just sort of came about at the right time. Um, when, when we found out he was available and made some contact, turns out that, you know, as a lot of people do, this, the, the U brand is, is, is very strong. And, and Keyshawn himself and, and his mom had kind of Always sort of loved the U, always kind of followed the U. So it was one of those things that once that con initial connection was made, and um, I think the first day, I believe the first day I was allowed out in January, I, f I flew to San Diego and, and got in the home and, you know, and at least got a chance to, to talk about who we were and what we were about and, and, and make the family feel really good about, uh, about letting Keyshawn come be a Miami Hurricane. I mean, just an update on some of the injured guys and their yeah. availability for spring, uh, particular with Bubba, Navon Donaldson, Jalen Phillips, and also have you set a date on spring ball starting? Yeah, spring, um, our first spring practice will be February 29th, which is a Saturday. I'm going to run a little list off of guys who will not participate that day or potentially all of spring. Um, Tyreek Austin Cave. Uh, we'll miss spring with a shoulder. Uh, Bubba Bolden will be coming back from his ankle. We hope to get him back sometime for spring. Um, Sam Brooks will be out for spring, uh, recovering from a shoulder. Uh, Don Chaney, same thing, will miss spring due to a shoulder. Navon Donaldson uh, will be out for spring, recovering from his knee. Um, Corey Flagg will be out for spring, again, just uh, uh, due to his knee. Uh, Bradley Jennings coming back from his hip injury. Uh, Brevin Jordan uh, coming back from his foot injury and Michael Redding with a wrist injury. Now all of those players we expect to have uh, by the time our team comes together in the summer, um, gets in training and can do player-led practices, things like that. We expect to have all those guys for sure when we start training camp. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can just touch on Bubba. You said you'd hope to have him back. Uh, yeah. Maybe what, what are you hoping he'll be able to do in the spring? No, he should be able to compete. If, 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 you know, if everything goes according to his benchmarks, we feel like Bubba would have a chance to compete at some point during spring. But that's we can talk about that as we get closer to spring practice in terms of that's, we're probably getting a little ahead of ourselves in terms of when and what and stuff like that. Great. Thank you very much, Coach. Outstanding. Thank you all very much.